This video is brought to you with the support of TrueFire. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to Five Art World, where we're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. In 1970, I was 10 years old, and my father had the Beatles' Abbey Road record on infinite repeat on the home stereo. Though my first electric guitar memory was hearing I Want to Hold Your Hand on the Cars AM radio, holding the cover of Abbey Road while the record played again and again was my first real exposure to the Beatles. My dad was a high school art teacher then, and these guys walking across the street could have been any one of my dad's artist friends that ran through our house in the 1970s. This was particularly true of the bearded and long-haired version of George Harrison. Wearing jeans and a denim shirt, he was much more relatable to my own denim-wearing world than the matching suit kids of six years earlier. It left me curious about this quiet beetle, and that curiosity has never really gone away. So if, like me, you want to know more about the stories behind the guitars he used, then stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of the guitars of George Harrison. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe, or grab a t-shirt, hoodie, hat, or a Stomp preset pack to support what we do. Or become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, sign up for the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. There's a friend level to suit any budget. The links are in the description. George Harrison was born on the 25th of February, 1943, the youngest of five children in Wavertree, Liverpool, England. His mother was very supportive of George's interest in music. She sang around the house and would tune in to Radio India's weekly broadcast, hoping the sitars and tablas would bring peace and calm to the busy household. Harrison's earliest musical memories were of Cab Calloway, Django Reinhardt, and Hoagie Carmichael. Later, Carl Perkins and Lonnie Donegan, of course, would be influences. By the time he was 13, he was filling the edges of his notebooks at school with drawings of guitars. He'd get his first guitar around that time, in either 55 or 56, an Egmond 105-0 Toledo, a beginner-grade flat top which his father had bought for two and a half pounds. Harrison rode the same bus as Paul McCartney, and they struck up an acquaintance. He would end up using the Eggman to audition for Lennon and gain a slot in the Quarrymen, the band that would grow into the Beatles. Just prior to joining the Quarrymen, Harrison was able to get a Hofner President model. Hofner guitars had begun being imported to England in 1953 through the Selmer Company. Harrison's President was one of the better models in the line, with a list price of 33 pounds. Harrison said, I got a pickup and stuck it on, attaching it to the end of the fingerboard. By 1959, the quarrymen had been able to book an extended gig at the Kaspar Coffee House. Lennon's aunt gave him a down payment on a Hofner Club 40 guitar, and Harrison was able to swing one as well. Harrison swapped his president for a 1957 Hofner Club 40, even up with Ray Ennis of the band The Shining Blue Jeans, who had a residency at the Cavern Club on Tuesdays. Harrison's Club 40 would be given away in a promotion for the 1966 Beatles tour of Germany. The guitar went to the winner of the Best Band Contest in Germany and went to Frank Dostel of the German band The Faces, who owns it to this day. Both Lennon and Harrison used their Club 40s in the Quarrymen's performances at the Caspa in 1959. The gig ended in October, and by the end of 59, Harrison was able to buy a future Rama on time payments. Many guitarists in England had been set on fire by images of Buddy Holly with his Stratocaster, but as American instruments had been banned from sale in the UK since World War II, fenders were near impossible to find. Harrison said, If I'd had my way, the Strat would have been my first guitar. But in Liverpool, in those days, the only thing I could find resembling a Strat was the Futurama. Futuramas were made in Czechoslovakia and first arrived in Britain just the year before in 1958. The guitars retailed for about £57. Pounds. It was no fender, but it was a solid body electric with three pickups. 1960 saw big changes. Prior to an audition, it was decided that they would rename the group the Silver Beatles, later shortened to the Beatles. The Futurama would be the guitar that Harrison would use on their engagement in Hamburg, Germany in 60 and 61. While in Germany, he just missed the chance to buy a Fender Stratocaster he'd heard of, but someone got there earlier than he did, and he took it hard. But he was still on the trail of a new guitar to replace the Futurama, and when they got back to Liverpool, replete in black leather now, he'd buy his 1957 Gretsch Duojet. When interviewed for Guitar Player magazine, Harrison recalled seeing the ad for the Gretsch guitar in a Liverpool newspaper. 
He said, I bought it from a sailor who bought it in America and brought it back. It was my first real American guitar. And I'll tell you, it was secondhand, but I polished that thing. I was so proud to own it. Harrison would play that guitar through the coming gigs in Hamburg and back at home at the Cavern Club, tours of Europe, and it went with him to America as a backup in 64. It was his voice on many, many early Beatles recordings. The 57 Duojet was built with a semi-hollow chambered mahogany body and a three-ply laminated top. It had a one-piece set neck and a single-ply white-bound rosewood fingerboard fitted with hump block inlays. There were 22 frets and a 24.5-inch scale length. There were two Dynasonic single-coil pickups, a three-position selector switch, a volume knob for each pickup, a master tone control, and a master volume knob. Harrison's had a Bigsby that had been added by the previous owner when he was still in New York. The combination of single-coil pickups and the semi-hollow body yielded a deep, rich tone, along with a sweet, clear treble response. In addition, Harrison really liked the thin neck, which was very comfortable for the long gigs that they were doing. It cemented his love of Gretsch guitars for the rest of his life. By 62, the Beatles had been into Abbey Road to record Love Me Do, and the staff there had complained about the poor state of the band's instruments. In the wake of that criticism, both Lennon and Harrison ordered Gibson Electric Acoustic J-160Es. Gibson had launched the 160E in 1954. Effectively, a J-45-style sloped-shouldered acoustic guitar fitted with a single P90-type pickup and volume and toe knobs on the top. They could be used for songwriting or plugged in to approximate the sound of an acoustic guitar live. The guitars were ordered at Rushworth's Music in Liverpool, and in hindsight, it's been guessed that the boys thought that they were ordering Gibson ES-175s like they'd seen being used by Tony Sheridan. The confusion seems to come from the description as electric acoustic. It might also have been them remembering Sheridan's pickup-equipped Martin D-28 from their days in Hamburg. Whatever the case, the receipt shows that the guitars cost £161 each and that the invoice was paid by the band's manager, Brian Epstein. That September, they returned to EMI's Abbey Road studio to again record Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. It isn't known what guitars we're hearing on the recording, but if the boys plugged the 160Es directly into their Vox AC30s, the sound could have been fairly similar to Harrison's Gretsch or Lennon's Rickenbacker, basically a clean and full tone. Early in 63, Harrison used a red Gretsch Firebird for a brief period, but it's believed that the guitar was borrowed. That summer, the Beatles were guitar shopping at Ivor Arbiter's Sound City in central London. It's often been said of the three Beatles, George was the one most interested in buying guitars. As Epstein had cut a deal with Arbiter for Ringo's new Ludwig kit, it might have been easier for Harrison to buy a guitar from Sound City. The guitar that day was a 1962 Gretsch Chet Atkins Country Gentleman. Arbiter was the UK distributor for Gretsch, and it was one of the prime places to find one. That guitar, a model G6122, had the early 60s double cutaway, two-inch thick hollow body with painted on F-holes, and it came with two humbucking Filtertron pickups that Gretsch had released in 57. A full 17 inches wide with bound top and back, it had the early 60s gold pickguard that simply said Gretsch, and not the full Gretsch Chet Atkins Country Gentleman that they would have later in the 60s. Harrison was delighted to have the guitar that was designed with Atkins, who was one of his playing heroes. That July, the boys were back at EMI recording She Loves You, and at that session, Harrison was playing his country gentleman. In July and August of 63, Harrison occasionally used an Australian-made Mayton Master Sound MS500 guitar. Mayton was a high-profile Australian company that was founded in 1944, and they began building electric guitars five years later. The MS500 was launched in 1958. Very few of these guitars made it to Britain at the time, so it's particularly interesting that George used one. The MS500 had a 24.5 inch scale, a bound solid body with flame maple natural finish top, and a sunburst back. The story goes that Barrett's music store in Manchester had lent Beatles road manager Neil Aspinall the Maiden while he was repairing two tuning pegs on Harrison's Country Gentleman. Afterwards, Harrison asked if he could hang on to the guitar for a little while, using it that summer. The guitar was eventually returned to the store when the Beatles were back in Manchester at a local TV studio. That September, the band took an overdue break, and George went to the U.S. with his brother Peter to visit their sister Louise. During the visit, George bought his first Rickenbacker, a 1962 single pickup 425 that would later be modified to have a second pickup and a selector switch. The neck through design was made of maple with a rosewood fingerboard. George only used the 425 for a short time, later giving the guitar to George Peckham, a guitarist who would become an engineer at Apple Studios. Problems with Harrison's Country Gentleman followed. 
Harrison may have removed the upper mute control knob because it was in the way of his picking hand, and that may have led to internal issues because he got a replacement country gentleman from Sound City. The second guitar was nearly identical, but it had a flip-up switches to control the mute rather than the earlier screw-down knobs. In January of 64, during a run of sold-out holiday shows, Harrison acquired a Gretsch Chet Atkins Tennessean. The single cutaway was equipped with the high Lotron single coil pickups that would be more cutting than the humbuckers on his double cutaway country gentleman. The Tennessean also had no string mutes. The guitar was either a 62 or a 63, but it's impossible to know as it's not owned by the Harrison estate today. In a deep maroon color with painted on F holes and a clear lucite pickguard that was spray painted silver on the back. Harrison used the Tennessean on numerous recordings and for live appearances in 64 and 65. I reached out to TrueFire to be my sponsor because I've used them for years. With over 2 million users worldwide, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, TrueFire has lessons to enhance and inspire your playing. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 35 or like I do, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire TrueFire catalog. I really like TrueFire and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Sign up now to start your journey to being a better guitarist. I'd like to thank Truefire for their support in making this video. Their first album on the new U.S. record label, Capital, was released on January 20th. The album release pushed the single, I Want to Hold Your Hand, to number one in the U.S. This was good news for manager Brian Epstein, as the boys had said that they wouldn't dare go to the States until they'd had a hit there. The Beatles arrived at JFK on February 7th and were met by thousands of screaming fans. Beatlemania was in full swing. Prior to the Beatles coming to America, Rose Morris, the UK distributor of Rickenbacker guitars, had reached out to Francis Hall, the owner of Rickenbacker, encouraging him to help the Beatles with publicity and encouraging him to meet with the Beatles and their manager while they were in the States. This led to the famous meeting at the Savoy Hilton. Hall was very interested in having the Beatles switch over to using Rickenbacker amplifiers, but the Beatles had a long-standing and happy relationship with Vox, so they were mostly interested in seeing the guitars. George hadn't been feeling well, so he'd stayed back at the hotel, but when the guys saw the 12-string, they knew George needed to see it. So they all walked across Central Park to show it to George. George later said in interviews that he immediately fell in love with the Rick 12. The 360-12 that Harrison acquired was one of the first electric 12-strings that Rickenbacker had ever made. The semi-hollow maple body had a single-ply white binding on the front and back, a single unbound cat's eye sound hole, and was finished in Rickenbacker's Fire Glow, cherry sunburst finish. It had a pair of Rick toaster style pickups with volume and tone controls for each. The bound rosewood fingerboard had Rickenbacker's triangular fret markers. See my video on the Rickenbacker 12 string history for more details on the creation of this groundbreaking instrument. Harrison's guitar could be considered a prototype as it was one of three proof of concept guitars built at the time. When the 360-12 went into production later in 64, it would retail for $550 the equivalent of approximately $5,400 today. On February 9th, the Beatles made their live debut on The Ed Sullivan Show in front of an estimated television audience of 73 million people. How many musicians have you heard say that it was at that moment that they knew they wanted to play full time? I've lost count. Harrison played his country gentleman, Lennon his Rickenbacker 325, McCartney his 63 Hofner, and Ringo his Black Pearl Ludwig Kit. The instrument lineup would be America's first and lasting impression of the Beatles, and it would be permanently etched on the minds of everyone that saw the performance. A music trade magazine headline read, Beatle George Harrison Rocks the Nation on Gretsch. Later that same month, they were back at Abbey Road. During those sessions, they recorded a new version of And I Love Her, with Star on bongos and claves instead of his kit. Harrison was on a classical guitar instead of on his Rickenbacker 12-string. Harrison had long loved classical guitar, and in an interview in 64, he admitted that he'd like to study classical guitar seriously. The influence of Andreas Segovia's world tours was still strong. Harrison used a Spanish-made Jose Ramirez Guitar de Estudio model. The Ramirez family had dominated the classical guitar world for decades, and the name of Harrison's guitar actually indicates that it was a mid-level instrument designed by Ramirez, but perhaps not built in one of the family's own workshops. The guitar was a gift from Klaus Vormann, a guitarist that Harrison had met during his time in Hamburg. Vormann had played some classical pieces on the guitar for Harrison, who was really inspired by it, and so Vormann gave the guitar to Harrison, and it was that guitar that ended up being on some of the Beatles' recordings. 
Along with Lennon's new Rickenbacker 325 12-string, delivered in 64, Harrison also got another 12-string, this time from Gretsch. The custom-built 12 on a single-cut 6120-style body had a custom nameplate that read George Harrison Model, but this was hopeful on the part of Gretsch because it was never put into production. Harrison really never cared for the wider fretboard and big body, and in the end he gave the guitar to John St. John from Sounds Incorporated when St. John's Guild 12 was damaged on tour. Early in 65, Harrison would finally get his first Stratocaster. Epstein sent road manager Mal Evans out to buy a Fender Stratocaster each for Lennon and Harrison. The only direction that he gave him was that they had to be the same color. Harrison recalled that this happened during the recording of Rubber Soul. The two 1961 Sonic Blue Strats were immediately put to use on the record. Harrison's Strat would later be painted in Day Glow paint in 67 and nicknamed Rocky. Harrison noted that Ticket to Ride was the last Beatles song on which he used his original 63 Rickenbacker 12 string. The electronics had started to show the hard use from the road, and later that year a radio station in Minneapolis, along with a local music store, arranged to give Harrison one of the new Rickenbacker-style 360-12s. The new Rickenbacker had the new rounded edges to the top and the checkerboard binding. Harrison didn't use the guitar on that tour, but he pulled it out in the studio when they returned to Britain. On a break in the band's schedule, Harrison bought a Ravi Shankar record, and his exposure to the Indian sitar master led him to buying a sitar for himself. It appears most prominently on Norwegian wood, of course. Harrison's use of the sitar, like the 12-string electric before, sent a ripple of interest through the music world, with other guitarists experimenting with them as well. And it could be argued that it led to the creation of the Coral Bell electric sitar slash guitar to make the sound more accessible to guitarists. Harrison would acquire his own Dan Electro built Coral Bell sitar in 67. We'd see this influence again on Sgt. Pepper's Within You, Without You. By this point, the Beatles were tired of having to promote their music in multiple TV appearances and decided to film their own performances of the songs and then share the tapes with studios around the world. So that November found them in the Twickenham Film Studios getting ready to perform, and Harrison arrived with a Gibson ES-345. The 345 was an upscale version of the 335, and you can learn more about its history in this video. George's 1965 ES-345 TD was only used for that short period, for the promotional films, and then on the following tour that would prove to be their last tour of Britain. It isn't clear if George owned the guitar or if it was loaned to him. Some speculate that he borrowed the guitar from Justin Hayward of the Moody Blues, a well-known 335 user, as Brian Epstein had recently began managing the Moody Blues. On that second short tour of Britain, Harrison's second country gentleman fell off the rack at the back of the car and was smashed. Harrison had given away his original country gent, so found himself without one of his most iconic guitars and was left playing the 345 for the remainder of that tour. During the Revolver sessions in 66, a number of new guitars appeared. McCartney had bought an Epiphone Casino back in 64, and now Lennon and Harrison each bought one as well. Both in sunburst finish, Harrison's guitar had a Bigsby vibrato, while Lennon's had a regular trapeze tailpiece. They played the guitars throughout the recording session and then on the tour of the U.S., Germany, and Japan. Later, both of these guitars would be stripped down to the bare wood on the assumption that it would make them more resonant. Also during the sessions, Harrison began using a Gibson SG Standard. Harrison's was a 64, and he'd use it as his main guitar and revolver, and then briefly on stage during 66. The guitar also made an appearance while filming the promotional clips for Rain and Paperback Writer, while John plays his new casino. George later gave the SG to Badfinger's Pete Ham, likely around 1969. Ham died in 75, and his brother sold the guitar at auction in 2004. Beatles manager Brian Epstein died in 67, and so the Beatles went into 68 without the guidance they'd always had. For spiritual guidance, they turned to the East with their famous trip to India, where they would write many of their songs for the upcoming White Album. It was headed into these sessions for the White Album that the casinos had their finishes stripped. This is widely attributed to comments made by the singer-songwriter Donovan, who had gone on the trip to India with them. Interestingly, in the famous photo, Donovan's own J45 <laughs> still has its original finish. During the White Album sessions, George used a Gibson J200 with the 60s-style tunematic bridge that he'd acquired when he was in the States. Harrison used the guitar to cut the guide tracks for While My Guitar Gently Weeps, while the rest of the band was doing overdubs with George Martin over in Studio 2. Harrison's 60s J200 had a maple, back, sides, and neck. Harrison later gave the guitar to his friend Bob Dylan, and some believe that it is the guitar that Dylan is holding on the cover of his 1969 album Nashville Skyline. 
The photographer on the shoot remembered Dylan saying that he'd been gifted the guitar by Harrison, and he wanted the pic to show him tipping his hat in thank you to his friend for the generous gift. In August of 68, Harrison would acquire his 57 Les Paul that would later be named Lucy after the red-headed comedian Lucille Ball. The guitar had previously been owned by John Sebastian of the Love and Spoonful, but then it was sold to Rick Derringer. The guitar had lots of road wear, so Derringer sent it back to Gibson to have the guitar's gold top removed and be refinished in the popular red of the SGs at the time. Derringer ended up not liking the way the guitar turned out, and he traded it to Dan Armstrong's guitar shop in New York. This is where Eric Clapton came upon the guitar and bought it and subsequently gave it to Harrison, who began using the Les Paul almost exclusively through that summer and well into 69. As the work on the White Album progressed, Harrison continued to work on versions of his song While My Guitar Gently Weeps, wanting to take it in a less acoustic direction. After again re-recording the song in a new key on September 5th, unhappy with his own lead attempts, Harrison brought in his good friend Eric Clapton to play a lead guitar part. Harrison didn't want it to sound too much like a Clapton blues solo, so they added a number of effects to the guitar tracks to make it sound more Beatles-y. Meanwhile, Fender had long been trying to get their instruments more visibly in the hands of the Beatles. And now, in the studio environment, they delivered a number of pieces during the recording of the White Album in Get Back. One of the more important items was a Fender Bass 6. The Bass 6 was first produced in 1961 and was a six-string guitar with a scale length of 30 inches that is tuned an entire step down from a regular guitar. The body shape was similar to a Fender Jaguar. Both John and George would begin using the bass six to play bass parts, beginning with the White Album. 69 and into 70, we'd see George in the studio with two new presents. One was a Leslie speaker cabinet, a gift from Eric Clapton. The second one was the famous custom Rosewood Telecaster sent by Fender. The guitar had been built by Philip Kubicki, who worked for Fender as a master builder from 64 to 74. Fender's marketing department wanted to add a new Rosewood Tele and Strat to the lineup and gave a prototype Strat to Hendrix around the same time. Kubicki built two prototypes of each, and then they selected the best to send on to the artists. The Rosewood Telecaster had a unique hand-rubbed finish and was flown to England with a courier in its own seat on the plane, being delivered to the Apple offices in December of 68. Harrison used the guitar extensively during the filming of Get Back, though he would also move to the Gibson Les Paul or the J200. And it was the Rosewood Tele that we'd see George playing at the rooftop concert on January 30th, 1969. Largely on the back of that appearance, Fender put the guitar into production for a few years starting in 69. After the rooftop concert, the Beatles all went their own way for a while. After working on an experimental album at his home, later released as Electronic Sounds, by Harrison's 27th birthday, he was back at Abbey Road Studios working on demos for his new songs, All Things Must Pass and Something. George Martin said at the time that he really thought the Beatles would break up after Get Back, but they ended up booking the studio from July 1st to August 29th. Based on the scant photos that exist of the session for Abbey Road, Harrison mainly used his Red Les Paul. The album was completed by the end of August and was released on September 26th in the UK and on October 1st in the US. The single, For Something and Come Together, was released on October 6th. Both the album and the single went straight to number one. Subsequent sightings of George playing with others saw him using his Red Les Paul and the Rosewood Telecaster. He'd be seen playing a number of Strat and Tele-style guitars later, including a 1987 Eric Clapton signature guitar in Torino Red. But nothing seemed to speak to him like his early guitars had. When I was finishing this script, I had a conversation with my good friend David Barber from Barber Electronics. David is also a student of rock history, so I asked him what guitars he pictured Harrison playing after the Beatles. He said his image of Harrison wasn't of him playing guitar at all. It was him playing the ukulele. He said, You'd read about people visiting Harrison at home, being handed a ukulele, and they'd sit in the garden and they'd play and sing old songs. At the end of the visit, Harrison would send them away with that ukulele. From this history, you probably have a sense that giving and receiving guitars was an almost spiritual exchange for Harrison. He certainly held the Lucy Les Paul in great regard, and he gave away instruments that had, at one time, meant a lot to him. I came away from this project feeling George cared more about the musicians that passed through his life than he did about the guitars he was playing when it happened. It left me with a new respect for Harrison as a guitarist and as a person. First, I need to thank Jamie Dixon and everyone at Guitarist Magazine for their permission to use the clip of Neville Martin playing a Fender Rosewood Telecaster. I think Neville nailed the vibe. I'll add that Guitarist is the only industry magazine I still get delivered. It's a treat every month. 
that. I need to thank John Cordy for his permission to use the clip of his playing the Epiphone Casino he borrowed from a mate up the road. He leans a little hard into the game maybe, but hey, we love John. See the description for links to the complete videos. This video would not have been possible without the exhaustive work of Andy Babiuk in his book, Beatles Gear. It is a must have for any student of Beatles or pop music recording history. If you enjoyed this video, you might like my video, The Guitars of Get Back. I want to thank everyone that stopped by the store and picked up a hoodie, a hat, a t-shirt, or the Stomp preset pack. And in particular, I want to thank the friends of 5 Watt. It's the guitar community I've always wanted. You're all 5 Watt world. I just make the videos. Thanks for hanging with me till the end. Until next time, I'm Keith Williams. Thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world.